on an earthly planet called Origin, life is filled with magic. In this video, I'll talk about how magic evolved and diversified from the beginning of life as we know it to today's 12 elements. They're all here on the screen. I know it's a lot to take in, but I'll go through each one bit by bit in order of when they appeared while telling their story. I'll make sure to draw lots of pretty visuals too, so you're not stuck with this eyesore. First, life on Origin is divided into two groups. Well, it's divided into a lot of groups, but if you had to cut in two, you'd do it this way. There's life as we know it, then life as we don't. All life and magic started in the second group, with the element of Null. We don't know much about these Null elementals, who we call the Origin, but there's proof that they built a civilization billions of years ago that only exists in ruins on the most desolate parts of the planet. I'll talk about them more in April, but as the story goes, a character called the Allfather survived a calamity that wiped out their civilization, and life as we know it came from them. There's lots of speculation on this Allfather character, who is recognized in cultures around origin, though they're known by many forms and names, the most common being the symbolism of their eyes and the element of fire. Most scientists agree that fire was the first form of magic to be discovered, and that it was found by the people of origin during the Allfather's time, perhaps by the Allfather themselves, before life as we know it began. Before we get into the element of fire, I'll also mention that some believe the Allfather was humanoid. More about that later, and there's also some even less credible ideas about the Allfather and the life in their time being elementals of magic we haven't yet discovered in modern times. I won't get into all of these, and you shouldn't even pause the video to read them, because it's honestly a waste of time. These five elements are nothing more than conspiracy theories. I mean, if it's not enough that they speculate an element of divinity, they speculate that there could be magic behind splitting an atom. I mean, it's just hearsay. As far as any credible source can say on origin, an atom is the smallest building block in existence. To split it would simply be impossible. Anyway, let's get back to some real science. Fire is a popular element for the flashy magic and usefulness of controlling energy. It's suspiciously common in humanoids, with the noir and trifle people both sharing it. The term for fire elemental is soul color, and there was once a sapient soul color that had no other elements, which is called a pure soul color. A close-ish relative is the Rhycorn, which is kind of the poster child of the fire element. Soul color aren't generally common in multi-celled organisms, though technically everyone has the fire element within them. When it comes to life as we know it, the first soul color was probably something called a mitochondria. As you may have heard, they're the powerhouse of the cell that turns sugar and oxygen into usable energy. While the majority of multi-celled soul color are mammalian, fire magic has also evolved in reptiles, plants, and even water elementals. There's also one sapient insect that shares the element of fire, which I'll talk about someday. Fire magic most commonly evolves in low food environments as a way to gain energy passively through temperature. Once more food becomes available, we see the more flashy fire magic everyone's such a big fan of, where energy inside the organism can be converted to fire. The first element to appear in life as we know it was most likely water. It's by far the most common element as well, with most single-celled organisms and invertebrates being Jinmar, which is what we call water elementals. It evolved because underwater survival happens to be extremely useful. If stories are to be believed, life as we know it began when the Allfather bathed in the heart-shaped lake of origin. This checks out with what we know, though obviously something like that is impossible to prove. The first arthropods and vertebrates were also Jinmar, and many have re-evolved water magic for various reasons, mainly underwater survival. Because many Jinmar can manipulate water as well, sea travel is pretty dangerous without a high-tech ship. A simple wooden boat would get tossed around by anything reasonably large, which led to the first magic enchantments by humanoids that started the Middle Ages, also known as this Age of Sea Exploration, when the rest of the world discovered the Oriental continent where most humanoids live. Enchantment is a complex form of magic where someone performs a spell on something, usually a metal like rhodium, silver, or platinum, that holds for an extended period of time. An example of a fire enchantment would be to make a platinum core sword burn when it swung, while an example of a water enchantment would be to make a rhodium plated platform float or to move through water despite its physics. Traditionally, platinum is used for active offensive spells while rhodium is used for more passive stuff. Silver is considered the cheap option. In reality, it doesn't actually matter which of the three you use, though platinum might allow for a teeny bit more potency and rhodium might hold spells for a little bit longer. 
Enchanting is super diverse and is part of what makes magic an art form, but I'll keep giving an example or two for each element. Also, if you're wondering how spells work, they're pretty simple. While a mage would use a spellbook to perform complex magic, most people can do a variety of simple spells. In all life, there's a chemical called mana that's essential for magic. It's also essential to be alive, as even something like a mitochondria use it to do their thing. Most of the time, though, mana production outmatches mana used by mundane, life-preserving tasks. This means you probably have some mana to spare to perform a spell or two. While rest or even just passage of time restores mana, you can also take some medicine to restore it quickly, usually some kind of syrup. Lastly, a curse is just a negative spell. There's no real line between spells and curses, it's just that a curse is bad and a spell is good or neutral. A third element to appear in life as we know it is the element of air, which represents the sky and those who are capable of flight. While magic isn't required to fly, it certainly helps. Usually an organism will simply be aerodynamic or perhaps have evolved an ability to glide, and from there it will evolve air magic to perfect its abilities. It seems that they still evolve a body that's good for flying, which then frees their magic to be used for other things like combat, defense, or supernatural flight. Air elementals are called zeolites, which can be found all over the animal, plant, and even microscopic kingdoms. On origin, unicellular Jinmar became airborne to conquer a then new realm, which gave way to earth elementals once they landed on dry ground, which evolved into the first plants we know. This age before animals was known as the age of spores, due to the abundance of tiny airborne life. In today's origin, the most common zeolites are dragons, usually pterosaurs or birds. Like I said, there's lots of other zeolites from mammals to fish to insects to plants. There's a notable lack of sapient zeolites, but the appearance of crazemoles has made many a sci-fi lover's dream come true. An air enchantment could be used to make a rhotic ship fly, or to make a silver sword more aerodynamic. Microscopic zeolites that landed on dry land acquired the element of Earth. These are called Donagai, and they're uniquely proficient at living on the ground, whether in water or in air. Some even have the ability to break down the silicon dioxide molecule for the O2 that they can use for respiration. Because of this, it's theorized that the Earth element evolved from organisms in low oxygen mud pools to help survival, and at some point early on this was no longer needed, and now most Donagai can't do that. Instead, most use it in various ways to control the dirt and sand around them, for defense like camouflage or armor, or offense like throwing rocks. I can throw rocks too, but I don't know any earth magic. Well, they can throw rocks even without our efficiently designed human arms, and they can throw them real good. While there was no known sapient Donagai for a while, the arrival of Padogs fulfilled that one. It wasn't as much of a dream come true as the sapient zeolites. Most fungi are Donagai, and symbiotic relationships with animals such as the punch lizard usually involve their combo gaining the earth element. The most well-known Donagai is the Glub Glossaurus, which I talked about in my marine reptiles video. A powerful earth enchantment can be used to make a rhodium plated structure sink a set distance underground, which can be used for anything from the foundation of a building to a full building being underground to save space. Rhodium, platinum, or silver aren't exactly common. So this is quite an expensive process for the latter example if you can't figure out a way to retrieve whatever you used. The next element to come into existence was plants, the first of two identity elements. This term means that the plant element evolved once, and those that evolved it haven't lost. So all plants are closely related to each other, and we simply call them plants. The defining characteristic is that an abundance of organelles called chloroplasts, which are a derived form of mitochondria that make energy from light. It evolved to make life above water easier, though since then some plants have come back to the seas. They have a cell walls made of sturdy fiber called cellulose, which allows for a solid structure without a skeleton. While most plants are stationary, there are two lineages of animal-like plants that are somewhat common. Flying plants are the most common around origin, though they're not rare in the seas either. Others are pretty rare, but thrive in certain areas. There's a sapient plant from the autotropic lineage that I made a video about. Plant enchantments aren't exactly common, but some pots or platches of soil are enchanted to speed up plant growth by 10 times. Silver has to be deposited into the soil, usually in a colloid, which isn't entirely healthy for plants, but businessmen consider it worth it for such a fast harvest. Because of how common silver is in the agriculture industry, 
An annual doctor's visit is often needed for most city dwellers to remove the heavy metal from their bodies. For a small time, farmers who can't afford silver, they simply go around their plants every morning to cast a growth spell, which is much healthier for the plants and the people eating them, but takes much more time and can even take a toll on the health of the farmer. Arthropod is the second identity element, and it represents the first one unique to animals. Their defining characteristic is a tough chitin armor, which makes for some of the most physically powerful organisms on origin, in exchange for low stamina and weak magic defense. While their strengths allow them to rule origin for millions of years, their weaknesses has caused them to fall behind in comparison to the vertebrates in modern times. There's a sapient arachnid and a sapient insect, both of whom are becoming increasingly rare. Giant arthropods are still quite successful in some places, but are more common in small niches. While nearly all flying arthropods are insects, there is one living species of flying arachnid. Insects were also the first animals to evolve the dragon element, which was technically identity until archosaurs evolved it later. I've got a ton of older arthropod videos, and though I've taken a long break, I promise they're coming back soon. Arthropod magic is a very carnal one that few non-arthropods can master. It involves communication beyond language, increasing senses, and boosting physical strength. The most desirable weapon enchantments such as sharpness, strength, or durability are all arthropod magic, though cheaper alternatives can be used with metallic magic. The difference is that arthropod magic is personal, while metallic magic simply strengthens the metal. Okay, halfway there. Now we're getting to the cool ones. Psychic is a powerful element that took over the planet in early times. The first fish were psychics, and the first tetrapods were also psychics. While most fish have lost that element, 90% of amphibians are still psychics. It evolved for predators to detect where their prey was, and for the prey to detect where their predators were. It's not certain which evolved first, but later predators evolved a different element. There are two sapient psychics, and many others are formidable and highly intelligent. Psychic magic is the most diverse of them all, and can be combined with others to make dual elemental spells. For example, Cataclysmic Rainbow is a legendary water psychic spell that releases huge amounts of energy after rainfall. Rumor has it it was named by a 14 year old in 2009. More common psychic enchantments involve stuff like cancelling out the weight of a rhodium core greatsword for one or more holders. This would, in theory, allow for a gigantic 600 kg dragon axe to weigh 10 kg for one person without sacrificing its legendary strength. It's speculated that the Good King's Axe uses this high power magic. An enchantment like this would usually just have a difference of 70% at best, and if it has the personal part about only lightening it for one person, it's difficult to get better than 30%. Because of this, most people think the Good King's Axe must be lightened by some other way, or maybe he really just is that strong. An element that evolved shortly after Psychic was the Dark Element. It came from a mutation in a Psychic, and so it's very similar. Dark elements are called loon specks, and they're a mysterious group of organisms that have a rivalry with psychics. While psychics are typically defense oriented, most loon specks are capable of powerful attacks, though they can't take strong attacks themselves. They're kind of like the glass cannon of elementals. The most well known loon speck is the witch, though, while most people know that they exist, few know very much about them. In 2079, there were two known sapient loon specks. And I don't mean two species, I mean two individuals, the Emperor and their son. In 2092, the Emperor passed, and with them the title went to their son. I'll talk about them later in the year, they're pretty important. Some animals are psychic and dark, such as the infamous Mage Bear. The most well-known dark magic is the DNA Scrambling Witch's Curse, and the dark enchantments tend to be more along the line of curses. You can make a platinum core sword painful to touch or even painful to be around, and if you want to use it to the swordman's advantage, you could keep it to the blade. Dark magic is well known to be dangerous, and it's a common saying that you shouldn't play with dark magic. The next element on the list is a controversial one called humanoid. It's defined as a representation of those made in the image of the Allfather, so while it's technically an identity element, most humanoids in power believe that the Allfather held that element, meaning there would be more than one lineage. The evolution from early carnivores to humans was suspiciously linear, which many people say is proof that it had divine influence. Humanoids are most likely the rarest elementals in the galaxy, though some say if the Allfather could do it on origin, there's no reason they couldn't do it anywhere else. While I like to think I'm unique, evidence to the contrary lies in the dogs. While they aren't humanoids themselves, 
They're capable of impressive magic of that element. Well, it's not a whole lot better than what simians can do, maybe even monkeys will become human. Humanoids are also very malleable in that they can merge their being with other organisms. While there are only six species of humanoids alive today, they come in countless forms because of how important the split being is in some cultures. That's all I'll say about it in this video, but I promise I'll talk in depth about humanoids sometime later this year. Onto the magic itself, humanoid spells are very emotional. There's a spell called Outrage that causes the caster to go into a blind rage when they release super strong attacks they otherwise wouldn't be capable of. An enchantment would attach powerful emotions to a piece of metal, the Calming Cube TM, which is a simple 4 centimeter cube made of a silver copper alloy imbued with a calming enchantment. You could also imbue an axe with Outrage to give similar power up effects to its holder. The second to last element in our list is Metallic. Evolving from a mutation in Donagai, it's another with strong physical qualities. Its beginnings can be seen early in the fossil record as metal tends to last a while. An early dragon in the Triassic that used mud to keep his claws humid went through a sudden mutation and lost its ability to control mud, instead commanding the metals within. This power is somewhat common in the way that it's evolved so many times over the course of biology. There are metallic trees, metallic buds, metallic birds, and so many more. There's also the whole controversy of synthetic life, and if that should be included with life as we know it, or life as we don't know it, or if it should be its own third division. I'll probably talk about synthetic life and their shady intricacies later this year too. Metallic enchantments are very common and cheap in armor and weaponry to make something more durable or strong, and it's also good at putting shards back together. Last but not least is Dragon. This element represents raw energy, the power of magic itself. It's evolved in two lineages, first in insects and then another in reptiles that we call archosaurs. It evolved in animals who are particularly large and strong, though their descendants that shrunk still keep their dragon element. Sometimes it can be gained in an individual who is imbued with particularly high levels of energy who would then be called draconic. This isn't a well-studied phenomenon, but it's certainly well known. No scientist can really say how it works, but common speculations from cultures that recognize draconics say it must be the work of the Allfather. This is why you usually see their symbol by anything draconic. When something that isn't a dragon is imbued with this energy, two things can happen. One is that the dragon element is added, such as the Cerberursa, the Pegasus Unicorn, or the Slow Silo. And yeah, no one's even sure those last two actually exist, but the legends certainly track with what we know about draconics. The second is explained by a theory that some don't actually gain the dragon element, which would possibly explain the great tealer of my supersized ship sinking seaweed sir of my supersized ship sinking seaweed sea serpents video. Supersized ship sinking seaweed sea serpents video. Lastly, certain powerful godlike beings are explained by the possibility of a dragon being imbued with draconic energy. This could explain Drazi, King of Skies, or Gentoon, Lord of Sea. As unrealistic as these are compared to other confirmed false legends, I've seen these gods with my own eyes. More and more people have these days, with the appearances of Fred Gale and Black Rain. Many say we live in uncertain times, but many have said so since the dawn of time itself. Dragon spells are usually just huge releases of energy, allowing something like a hammer to release way more energy than you put into it. It's well known that the Good King's Axe is enchanted with dragon energy. There you go, that's all the elements. I hope you enjoyed my description of magic in the world I made up. I promise the information you learned in this video will never ever be useful. Seriously though, it means so much to me that hundreds of people tune in to listen to me info dump about this stuff. 700 subscribers is crazy. I couldn't even name half that many people in real life. I know the internet has its downsides, but it's so cool that people around the world want to hear some girl's made up magic system and can actually do that. Someone even drew fan art. Knight Elk Warden on Tumblr and Twitter, their links are in the description. Genuinely such a talented artist and it's so cool that anyone cares enough about what I make with that much effort into it. That's enough with the sappy stuff though, I'm not crying. If you've got any criticism or really anything else you want to say, I'd love to hear it. Or I guess read it. I wouldn't have made this video so soon if it wasn't for that guy saying Origin is just Pokemon fanfic, which despite that first part was a great comment. They told me what they like and what they don't like, in enough detail that I could actually do something about it. In this case, I kinda agreed that I don't talk enough about the actual evolution, so I'm gonna do more of that now. 
Also, if you've got questions in the comments about story or lore, I'll do my best to answer them. And if I don't, it's a mystery. Ooh. Seriously though, <laughs> some things I'm planning on talking about later, like most of the organisms I teased, so I might be a bit vague till those come out. That's all I gotta say. Check out my Patreon, which you can subscribe to for just a dollar a month to support me and get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop, and thanks Art of Dying. This was an unscheduled video and kind of a random release, so check out my last Vec Evil video to know what's coming next. Something tells me it might be giant arthropods though. Thanks so much for watching!